C-SPAN is rolling. All right. How's it going, guys? Is everyone having a good day so far? Hopefully learning a lot? Good, good. Um, so I'm here to introduce your moderator, Shana Glickfield. Um, I'm actually very excited about this panel, because I think this is something that we all need to be talking about more. I think it's an interesting issue. I think it's an, an off, the, off the beaten track issue that I think will be, uh, be very interesting to, to discuss. Um, so Shana is currently a partner at a new, a new very innovative very cool firm called the Beekeeper Group. Um, she's a partner there. And not only that, but she is the uh, editor of nextgenweb.org. And she is the writer of DC Concierge. I don't know if you, guys have ever, if you guys have ever read DC Concierge, but it's very, very good, um, very entertaining. So um, Shannon is an amazing person, like seriously. She has been a big help for this conference. I've appreciated everything she's done. And we really just have a knockout panel. So uh, from there, I will uh, leave it to her. Great. Thank you so much. Wow. The microphone is definitely on. Um, so welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and introduce our panelists first. OK. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, so to my right, I have Dahlia. Mogahed, and she is a senior analyst and executive director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies, where she provides data-driven research and analysis on the views of Muslims around the world. And next to her, we have Matt Reyes, and Matt is a marketer and speaker with Photo Latino, and is also the founder of Twitteros.net, which is a Latino Twitter community. And next to him, we have Navarro Wright, and Navarro is the president of Maximum Leverage Solutions, and he co-founded the hip-hop community um, globalgrind.com with um, legendary hip-hop mogul Russell Simmons, and formerly served as the CTO of BET Interactive. And at the end, we have Bill Meyerling, and Bill um, is in the multicultural practice at Edelman, has been there since 2008, and he's counseled a wide array of clients on their outreach and engagement with um, multicultural communities. So like um, Bryce said, we do really have a knockout panel here today. Um, I, as he also mentioned, I'm with NextGen Web, which is the online community of US Telecom, the Broadband Association. And on the website, we talk a lot about the benefits of broadband, like health IT, distance learning, public safety. And um, one of the things we also cover is the topic today, which is how broadband and technology are really powering participation at unprecedented levels. So I'm really excited to talk about that. And to kick things off, I just wanted to let everyone know, um, you know, more than 75% of Americans are using the internet now on a regular basis. On top of that, US mobile penetration is predicted to top 100% by the end of 2012. Um, so we're also seeing significant positive trends and minority adoption and usage of these tools. And we want to know, or what our panelists will hopefully help us understand, is what does all this mean for candidates, campaigns, organizations, and businesses? So to get to the bottom of all this, um, I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, so first off, I'm going to go to um, a study by the Joint Center Media and Technology Institute. They found in February of 2010 that a number of minority internet users, specifically they studied Hispanic and African American, um, the number is steadily increasing, but the data suggests that minority groups are overrepresented as new internet users and underrepresented as experienced internet users. And therefore, minorities may be disproportionately disadvantaged in accessing, understanding, or fully appreciating some of the newest web platforms. Um, can you guys tell us a little bit of what that means for communicators, or what, we, what, what should we be thinking about? Navarro? I'll, I'll, take, a, I'll take a jump. I think, um, so I think a couple things. I think first, when you look at the numbers, um, the numbers you quoted, you know, 75% of Americans have access to broadband, and that mobile is seeing almost 100% penetration. If you take a deeper look at those numbers and look specifically at minority communities, those numbers are, are less than half of that. 
Um, and then secondly, when you look specifically at the mobile space, and I've actually been looking at this over the last couple of weeks, is that when you talk about mobile, ben mobile um, penetration of broadband, what does that really mean? You know, when you look at uh, the different type of devices that the minority community uses versus mainstream community, the access and level of services that they have provided, that when you go about and come up with a campaign of how you message to them, you can't say, hey, I'm just going to create an iPhone app and I'm going to be able to message that community because those devices aren't there yet in proliferation. Um, so there's a generational gap as well. So I think you really need to look at kind of the cultural specifics of that market and where they are in kind of the adoption landscape specific to carrier and device. Bill, what do you see? Uh, well, <clears throat> looking at the percentage of uh, saturation of multicultural communities, oh. looking at the percentage of saturation within multicultural communities and uh, internet access, uh, via online device or via the internet in general. I think we need to be looking at, I get my own mic, I think we need to be looking at the overall representation over time and building trust with communities, uh, multicultural communities in specific. Um, in 2008 it was 58.2 percent saturation rate with uh, multi African American audiences, 53.5 with Latinos, uh, and we're looking by 2014 at a 70 or 72 percent um, saturation rate with access to broadband. Um, during all of this time, uh, we need to be looking at building trust uh, and engaging communities in terms that uh, they understand and are willing to work with. I'm going to jump in. I'm a numbers guy, sorry. Um, I think that the key point um, that my colleague made was access to broadband, which is fundamentally different than having adopted broadband, right? I mean, I think we firmly believe that in a large part of the United States, there's broadband access. But specifically, when you speak to minorities in urban communities, the adoption rates are tremendously low, right? And there's a lack of value. And what I, what I like to call a lot is there's um, the, the value proposition is not there. They haven't been educated on to what the value of broadband can really bring to their lives, whether it's, you know, ease of their lives from a professional standpoint, whether it's from an educational standpoint or medical standpoint, that knowledge is not there, so they don't see the value in that, which is also ties into why mobile broadband access is so high, because they can at least see the value of that as a communication device. So if we were to take that into a tactic, it would be to make sure that your, your websites and your communications are mo mobily enabled. Well, I, I think mobily enabled, yes, but, but culturally relevant to understand and speak to the, the needs that they need to, to have an understanding of. I mean, I think you, you can't go out with the assumption. I mean, I've seen everyone in the office here has some type of smartphone. This man has a battery connected to his iPhone. It looked like it came from his car. So, you know, we're all connected and we all know how these devices work. When you go into these communities, that knowledge is not there. So I think it's the responsibility of any business who wants to benefit from those communities to do that education because you're actually creating new customers or new constituents for yourselves. Matt, what are you seeing in the Latino community? Yeah, well, I, I represent Voto Latino and we're, we have, um, can, can y'all hear me? Is it fine? Yeah? So we have, we're, we're there for uh, young Latino activists um, and what we've seen online is, is that they are very early adopters so I'm kind of trying to figure out what kind of what stu what kind of question they ask that's the the recipients of that study um, because what we've seen at Voto Latino and what I've seen just in private business is that a lot of uh, a, a lot of young people that are online are extremely early adopters especially when if they're minority they're actually over index in, in learning how to use the the uh, whatever medium I mean on tr on Twitter if everyone's on there I'm sure everyone's on there right now um, a, lot, a lot of the trending topics are driven a lot by African Americans and Hispanic uh, which is very interesting to see um, just in the campaign that we're running right now for the, the 2010 census be kind of represent.com we actually trended on Twitter two weeks ago for the census. <laughs> I don't know how it happened, but we trended on Twitter for Be Counted under that. Um, and so that just goes to show like the younger audiences there, of course, as a whole, there's a lot less um, adoption rates or, or penetration amongst different markets. But when you, when you slice it into younger demographics, it's there and, and they're actually well ahead of the general market when it comes to adopting it. So it, it kind of counteracts as, as a whole what that study was saying um, if you slice it to, uh, to a younger audience. Yeah. Well, the community that I spend uh, my time studying are Muslim Americans and, and Muslims around the world. And what we find among Muslim Americans specifically is incredible diversity. Uh, there's no majority uh, ethnic group. So uh, 
35% of Muslim Americans are African American, and that's the largest group. So there's a tremendous amount of variety within the community. But one thing we do find is that they are more likely than the general public to have just a mobile phone, just a cell phone only household, and are very internet savvy. One of the reasons, one of the drivers of that is the average age of the community is much, much younger. So reaching the community through new media is, uh, is probably not the biggest obstacle. I think a larger obstacle uh, in reaching the community is going to the places that they access. Um, finding the, the language and, and the websites that they're, uh, they're most likely to read, and then um, connecting to that younger audience uh, on sort of the issues that concern them. Great, thank you. So um, looking at from a more tactical perspective of communicators, again, going back to the position of candidates or organizations who do want to reach uh, minority venues. Um, so we often want to share our stories as communicators, whether it's through our own organization, ourself, or agencies, or things like that. What um, what should communicating communicator professionals be aware of when reaching out to your audience? Um, is it necessary to be bilingual, for example? Matt, I'll hand it to you. Is it necessary to be bilingual? I guess one of, one of the main things that I've seen amongst young Latinos is that 90% of the total young Latino population, whether it's unacculturated or, un or acculturated, actually prefer English when it comes to communicating with their friends or uh, consuming media. Um, so that number is ex extremely high when it comes to 90%. Even amongst first generation Hispanics whose parents are from another country, they actually prefer English media consumption uh, when it comes to that, that sort of thing. So bilingualism, at Evoto Latino, we make sure to, of course, throw in some Spanish nuances um, when it comes to that. but. You know, English English is probably the way to go, especially for a young demographic. It's been it's been actually the 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 hardest thing to come across. When I used to uh, when I do private uh, business consulting, when, when I, it's it, that's actually the hardest point to get across to 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 your clients. Like you know, um, young people do prefer English uh, amongst the Hispanic community. So it's it's been very interesting to watch um, clients. Uh, Kind of shift their their minds, I think, and 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 do shift their strategy when it comes to communicating to these to the uh, to this community. So, yeah. I guess I, I'm going to have a maybe a counterintuitive answer, and specific to Muslim Americans, I think first of all, I don't think you need to be bilingual. I think the it's at least young people, 90 percent or above, um, prefer English, and are fluent in English. Um, but the maybe the counterintuitive piece to candidates and to uh, people wanting to reach Muslim Americans is to not uh, to not tailor your message too much to actually be more mainstream and uh, and speak to them as you would sort of an, any other community any other mainstream community where you're talking to them about issues around the economy or healthcare or whatever and I think that when uh, when we over uh, tailor messages to some groups, it actually can cause uh, more of a, an, a feeling of alienation than, um, than, you know, than being uh, tailored to. So the advice I think I'd have is, is to make uh, the message very mainstream. I have to agree with uh, both Matt and Dahlia, uh, specifically with regard to Latino audiences here in the United States, uh, where over time as acculturation uh, continues and grows, we need to be aware of cultural nuance, um, but also understand the interest of any given multicultural community to assimilate or integrate into American society. Uh, therefore, you know, we look at it and we want to make sure that we are blending our culturally nuanced messages, but at the same time, not making that audience that we're trying to reach feel separate from the mainstream. Just to go off of what Bill was saying, um, I'm from Texas and, and in the Southwest, like there, there's a bunch of cities that are influenced by Hispanics and um, by, uh, by young Latinos. I mean, just in Austin alone, when I, <laughs> when I lived there, there we, there, there is just an interesting connection of, of, uh, of mixing different kinds of music and mixing different kinds of, 
of media together like with, di with different cultures and the same thing can happen in LA and that sort of thing uh, amongst Asian populations there. Um, and uh, we're, we're actually uh, running a campaign in California um, targeting both Asian and Latino populations, young Latino populations. Um, the reason being is that they both have similar stories when it comes to uh, when it comes to immigration, um, and they also hang out with each other. They both listen to to Pitbull for so you know, like it's on it's on the radio that sort of thing. So um, we we try to create a camp a campaign that resonates with the mainstream, one foot in the mainstream and the other foot um, uh, within their culture, um, and and that that is just representative of how millennials are today. I guess it's I. I my friends in particular are, are not just all Hispanic. Like th this notion of targeting can be dispelled by, by our generation, I think. So I guess it's a different approach. I think Bill was saying that, you, or you were saying, Dalia, that you need to make it mainstream um, with a hint of something else. Because there, there's secondary markets that we, that we interact with as well. Like we call them Latinos de corazón, so uh, you know, Hispanics by heart who have interacted with uh, the Hispanic community and kind of somewhat identify. I mean, I have a friend who's uh, who's uh, who's white who loves uh, the Hispanic culture and knows more Spanish than I do, and that's been a really cool thing to see, um, uh, especially in these communities in the Southwest and on the East Coast as well. So, um, to delve even deeper into kind of tactics, um, I wondered. What strategies would you advise to someone who wants to communicate with your um, particular culture? Um, if, for example, a candidate wanted to be more inclusive or you know, your, your culture is well represented in their base or community, um, what strategies, for example, would you recommend that they look up blogs and, you know, um, that are for your culture base and do blogger relations that way, or maybe you would recommend they actually hire a minority ambassador or you know something like that. What would what would you recommend? And I'm going to start with Navarro. Um, yeah, I don't know if uh, I don't know if an ambassador I think is is kind of strong. I do think they need to um, to have an understanding, you know, on any audience they go after, have an understanding of where they gather their information from. Um, and whether it's, whether it's they advertise there, whether it's they get their message there. I mean, the beauty of the Internet and the beauty of social media is that it, there's infinite scale. So if you have um, multiple messages that you need to get out to unique subgroups of people, you can get them out all at the exact same time, and you can react to them. So the key thing I would say is, one, to get those messages out on the sites that they live, but also give them reasons to come back to kind of the destination site. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think the Obama campaign is probably the archetype of a lot of that stuff that, you know, he had, he had profiles everywhere from Black Planet to Asian Avenue to Facebook to wherever or anybody lived. And he was able to give unique messages on those platforms to show that, hey, I understand the issues that I need to address with you, but at the same time bring people back to a central point so that they were kind of unified. So it allows you to do both. Uh, and I think that's where the focus would need to be. Uh, among Latino communities, I would, I would definitely recommend engaging people uh, with geographical awareness. Uh, I think the geographical awareness is twofold. Uh, first, it may be country of origin or heritage. Uh, and then second, area of residence in the United States. Uh, I specifically believe that engaging people, again, uh, to, to build off of what Nav Navarro was saying here, not so much an ambassador. Uh, but individuals who are engaged and well-placed in communities, be they bloggers, be they influentials in the online media, or be they community activists who have a propensity for online platform use. Uh, I say this because you may have a Guatemalan who is better able to address other Guatemalans about a specific policy issue here in the United States, uh, or a Nicaraguan or El Salvadoran that has a different take on it for his or her own community. Uh, secondarily, in terms of uh, geographical awareness for the United States with Latino audiences, uh, I think there's a, a difference in propensity for use of second languages or primary languages, um, depending on where you are in the United States. Uh, whereas here in Washington, D.C., if you look Latino, uh, you will probably be addressed in Spanish, and it's completely acceptable. Uh, I expect that that acceptance is derived from the vast international focus of the area, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, the Inter-American Development Bank, and so on. Uh, whereas on the southwest border, if you look Latino, 
it may be considered insulting to address someone in Spanish or to approach them via a Spanish, uh, Spanish web portal. Um, that's a good point. So, uh, Matt? I mean, in, in terms of like re reaching out to uh, like in, in amongst different uh, uh, social net shows, social networks, I, one, one thing that I was arguing uh, or, or trying to relate to my to my colleagues at work was, OK, so there, there, there's this uh, there was a statistic that said a lot of organizations were leaving out minorities because they shifted from MySpace to Facebook really quickly. And so. Uh, I was like, well, let me look at the numbers really quickly. And that existed for a good year when Facebook was getting more popular amongst the mainstream. Um, but then they, they made a, a, a really interesting shift and, of course, opened it up after col uh, they weren't college-centric anymore. Um, and, of course, a lot of minorities weren't in college or are, are still, still do not get, get into college. So that was the reason why Facebook wasn't big. But within the past six months from the statistics that I saw six months ago, that migration is pretty much pretty much done from MySpace to Facebook, even amongst um, unacculturated Hispanics. Um, and, and that was that was something that I that I saw that, that was really interesting is that they're they're on Facebook now. Um, a study done by a colleague of mine in Austin at Latin Works um, advertising um, brought in 20 unacculturated um, uh, people into, into a room and asked them, how many of y'all do you have uh, have a Facebook account? And these included um, some custodial uh, staff. This included just people from around the community. 19 of the 20 of them raised their hand, saying that they had a Facebook profile. Of course, they're not, they're not on it all the time. They go to the library. They go uh, through their phone uh, to get, on, get onto the network. But it's interesting that that's kind of become their, the, uh, the, the social network now compared to even six months ago. Five to six months ago, that's, I saw the statistics just flip. So it's been really interesting to see that 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 exists right now. Um, so I think that uh, you know an interesting thing about the Muslim American community is, uh, unlike other some other faith communities, we don't have an, a hierarchy. But in place of a, uh, a formal hierarchy, there are multiple networks, and I think that people wanting to reach this community have to tap into a number of networks, starting with national organizations, uh, not to sideline, um, you know, organizations that are trying to be representative of the community on a national scale. I think that's where, uh, you know, a, a candidate should begin to, to have that credibility. And then they should also go to informal networks like those uh, around popular bloggers. Um, and then finally, uh, to to connect to the community on a very local level with very large uh, institutions. Um, but there has to be a number of touch points uh, to really tap into such a diverse and, and um, dispersed community. So we talked a lot about social media sites here and using those. Um, and with the proliferation of social media sites, especially among minority communities, are we really seeing actually improved communication like by communicators to these populations? Is social media enabling a better conversation there or do we just have more opportunities that we really haven't tapped into yet? And I'm actually gonna pass this microphone. So, so I definitely think the opportunities are higher. I mean, I think the key question is, are people taking advantage of those opportunities? And what's the value in those increased opportunities is that the first level is there's a validation. So your message can get passed along to someone else by someone that they already trust, so they look at it with a higher level of credibility. And then secondly, it allows the, the, the users you're engaging to feel a level of control. I mean, just as we're sitting up here, I just got a, uh, a post from a social media site that said Mountain Dew just released three fan-created flavors of their drink. Right now, if you think about that, you think of the institution of Mountain Dew and how much of that is a shift that they actually went to their users and said, hey, what flavors do you like? And the most popular flavors, they changed their supply chain and created brand new flavors. So that gives the users who are there who they felt like they're a part of that process. So, of course, they're going to buy more of that. And secondly, that allows them to have direct connection with their audience and increase consumers. So if you look at that model, I think anyone from a campaign to a business can take elements from that and really achieve kind of a, a synergy between the people they're trying to connect with. Yeah, yeah. The one mic is a bit problematic. Mm -hmm. um, I 
definitely agree with Navarro here on on the idea of online engagement uh, and engagement in general with multicultural communities uh, where Latino African American Muslim American communities are largely decentralized uh, there is not one specific access point touch point uh, area of origin etc um, I believe that online groups, online platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, are giving us new opportunities to reach trusted community elites uh, and allowing those people to carry the messages, allowing them to repurpose information. Um, information given by a trusted friend is far more valued and we've seen recently, I would say over the past 10 months, Latinos and African Americans specifically uh, highly trust messages delivered to them by their friends on social media platforms like Facebook. Uh, they're more likely to buy products recommended by their friends and more likely to subscribe to services or say, in this case for politics, support a candidate. Um, just to offer another statistic that's very interesting, over the course of 2009 and here into 2010, uh, Latino and African American use of Twitter has grown 770% uh, and uh, Latino use of Facebook has grown 65% just in the past 18 months. <laughs> All right, this is going to be my last question before I open it up, and I'm going to do a looking forward, let's see how good you are at predicting trends question. <laughs> um, so one of the uh, fastest growing demographic groups in the country is multiracial Americans, and I wondered what advice you have for preparing um, as communicators how we can better prepare or address this new uh, growing demographic. Matt? So um, Hispanics are by nature multicultural, multiracial. So it's 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 kind of something that's not new to the population, um, and, and even amongst I'd say the majority of America is becoming that way. Even if if they are, you know, mostly European, but they've interacted with different communities. So culturally, we are multicultural. Even if you're in in, in Iowa, in the middle of Iowa on farmland, I'm sure. Sometimes you have you are connected to different communities, uh, and um, so I think the the trend that that we always try to make sure to 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 watch for is that there's 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 different areas of influence of uh, of cultures like in the southwest there's it's very Hispanic oriented, um, in, in the southeast African American, um, and so use that not as the whole but use that as a point of reference to direct any sort of messaging, that sort of thing. Um, and, and not to, I guess, separate. I, I think my whole thing is that separating groups can can sometimes just put people into silos and, and not interact with, with any others when the reality is the quite, quite the opposite. When uh, there, there's, there's this, I think, different, amount, different amounts of synergy amongst different communities just by the very nature of, of, of being in this country, so. Oh, sorry. I think that the biggest uh, the biggest trend that we're going to be seeing is that less and less people will define themselves according to a specific ethnic group. And because of how um, multicultural one family could be, I mean, the community that I study, Muslim Americans, are very multicultural. No, no majority, uh, you know, has a, has its uh, dominance on the on the group in terms of a race, and then they're a great deal of intermarriage between people of different um, race backgrounds. But I think that uh, where we'll see more of the definition is around generation. And so communicators will really have to tailor their message, not necessarily to a specific race group, but to a specific age group, that actually within a uh, specific uh, generation, regardless of ethnic background, there will be common factors. And so I think the, the dominant um, identity marker will just be shifting in the future. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm less, um, I don't think that, you know, the, the whole term multiracial is anything new. I think, you know, we're a multiracial culture today. I actually think if, if, if you really want to look for in terms of two groups that exist, they're, you know, 
when we talk about age groups, we talk about, you know, the digital natives, which are, you know, the 10-year-olds, the, the, the 25-year-olds now who grew up with the Internet with them as part of their everyday lives versus the, you know, a lot of us in this room who are kind of digital immigrants. We've kind of been dragged kicking and screaming into the Internet age, and we kind of coexist. And I think the other two groups that we really need to focus on are, are the connected and the disconnected. You know, I think we, we look around the room and, you know, when would you ever think you'd come to a government conference and it would be sponsored by AOL and people who have iPads a week after they came out? I mean, if that kind of shows you the speed in which things are, are covering industry, but there, you know, for every new launch of a new product or a new idea, there's still a subgroup out there that, that doesn't have a connection to it, right? They may heard about it, but they won't touch it or interact with it until we're much later down the path. And as that accelerates, that gap's going to widen. Right? So I think there's opportunity there from a business standpoint. I think there's a need there from a, a political standpoint to address those issues. And I think regardless of race, because on the connected side, it is multiracial. If you go to Silicon Valley, it's a very diverse set of people creating new tools and applications. And race really doesn't really become the issue there. It's more about knowledge and free open sharing. But in the disconnected world, it is disproportionate to minorities. But I think at the same time, if we kind of brought them over, you would, you would solve a lot of those issues. Just one point to add and also to agree with Matt uh, and to give a little bit of a window into the diversification of America. Uh, I am a Nicaraguan, German, first generation American. Uh, and more and more we are seeing really interesting cross-cultural communities and individuals who feel uh, a, a very strong value from messages delivered to them both by the general market and by uh, or in reference to their, their cultural heritage. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's changing the way communicators communicate. Rather, I would say it's changing the lenses or windows through which uh, our communities view messages. Uh, much like has been said throughout the panel discussion so far, uh, I believe it's important that we continue to outreach and engage multicultural communities, but at the same time, uh, making sure that our contact with them is relevant uh, and specific to issues of importance to the community. Um, I say this and it seems, it seems very generalized in the statement, um, but it's very important to understand uh, that our communities are interested in hearing messages that are important to them while not as communicators pandering those communities or pandering to those communities uh, around issues that we perceive as of importance. All right, we're actually going to open it up right now. And Shireen, digital sister, saw your hand go up. I believe there's a microphone coming around, too. Oh, there's not. This is it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have two questions. Um, Matt, uh, in terms of the younger generation being early adopters uh, and using tools like Twitter, how does that translate into voting, taking action, actually building some of these apps and not being the consumers of it? In addition to the MySpace piece, um, you're saying they moved over to Facebook, but Facebook does not have any data points that you can collect ethnic diversity to know what the real numbers are. So in terms of numbers, how are we really tracking that and really looking at that? And Navarro, um, my question to you is just in terms of mobile access, and it, with 12% with of the population of African Americans actually having smartphones, um, what does that change, how does that change the strategy in terms of addressing them for campaigns, for organizations, and otherwise? Okay. Let's see if I remember. Can, can I roll? I don't know. There it is. All right, great. I guess the first question is how, how can. Uh, yeah, politicians or in campaigning, how, how can they reach their audience? And that's, that's really through sustainability. Uh, and if, if they're barely introducing themselves when, when they get on Facebook to a certain community, they haven't done their job. <laughs> it's just a way to extend what they were already doing. Um, so I think, I, think that was, I think that's my main point is if, if they haven't reached out to that community already in, 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 their, in their grassroots experience, then I think that is, that is something that, that that should be addressed before they hop onto a social network and start running a campaign. I think offline interaction is probably the best way to interact with any community. Uh, I guess the, the second question is, yeah, you're right, face, Facebook does not track a uh, person's ethnicity, but you can try, and that's where your research comes, comes uh, into play when uh, you're researching different music tastes, different um, interests, that sort of thing. I know what we did. Um, if you were to 
by Facebook ads or something like that. You can do it by by uh, musicians liked, by different interests, um, by Spanish language. Um, one, one thing we focus on is mostly music from our end. Um, a lot of our campaigns are music driven uh, and celebrity driven as well. Um, and those also cover mainstream people who, who feel Hispanic as well just from their interactions. So, um, so even though that it doesn't cover which ef exact ethnicity there is, there, there's, there's cultural reference points that you, that you can use for it. Okay, so uh, answer a couple points. Not going to go in reverse. I think so. I think in general, whether it's it's mobile or um, or the web, kind of deploying technology for technology's sake without taking into account the specifics of the audience, um, you know, is kind of backwards, and it won't give you kind of any kind of success metrics. I, I do believe that specifically in the mobile space, anyone who's going out to try and reach a broad audience has to take a kind of multi-tiered approach. I think, again, you know, looking out uh, to some of the vendors out there, if you're going to come up with a new campaign app and say, you know what, I'm going to deploy it on the iPad and it's going to reach, you know, a diversification of audiences, you're just wrong because that device is, just hasn't permeated yet. Um, and, and like the, 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 the number of 12% of smartphone proliferation through minorities is, is a good start. But it kind of shows you that if you're trying to get to a widespread of minorities, an iPhone app is not going to do it, right? You're going to have to go native. You're going to have to look at the devices that they're using. You know, and then you may even have to look at going through SMS. Because if you look at a lot of those numbers, really a lot of that usage is around SMS to a large piece of the minority community. They're, they're not using the mobile browsers because they're, you know, the mobile browsers on the phone that they get from a prepaid provider or a tier two provider doesn't have access to the sites that you know you're presenting them to. So what you what I find is a lot of people use use those mobile numbers as kind of excuse to not address the issue that there's a big gap and divide there. So I really think from a business perspective, you have to account for it, or you're losing out on customers and opportunity. I guess. The to piggyback off that, um, I, I think one of the main things I try to drive home is that lo-fi works. Even though there's, <laughs> people always ask like, what's the next Twitter, what's the next Facebook? I, I, part of me doesn't care because, you know, let this be in place. Like if there's a mainstream that's already exists or if there's a communication that already exists, lo-fi works. I mean, even if you have like the, the prepaid phones, SMS, I mean, we've done, we're doing an SMS campaign right now that's extremely successful that works really well amongst all communities, even young communities, it's probably more successful than, than social media at, at some times because they get to pass it along and it's very instant. I mean, I don't get to check my Facebook message right now until after this panel, but if <laughs> there was a, a, a message that came through, it would come up really quickly. So I think, you know, SMS, of course, that penetration is there. The, one of the most interesting statistics that I found was 25% of iPhone users are Hispanic, <laughs> and that was that was a crazy. Uh, you can Google it and look it up. You'll find the statistic. Um, if you go to the sports uh, category on your iPhone in the, in the iPhone App Store, the Univision uh, football app is is number one. Um, that's due to lack of competition, though. That is due to lack of competition, and that's an opportunity for uh, for for other businesses and that sort of thing. So there's there's not. It's kind of an all-in an approach. You, you shouldn't just focus on your iPhone. What we did was focus on every phone from WAP, WAP, all the way to, to the iPhone. So it's, it, it was multi-tiered to cover pretty much every smartphone even, and down to the most fa very basic phone that handles SMS. Bill, I, don't, I don't know if you want to chime in, Bill. No? no? Okay. Another, any other questions? Navarro, you talked a little bit about education. Um, how do you see education bridging the divide, the, the digital divide between those who have uh, these technologies and, and those people who haven't quite yet adopted them? Uh, so, so, example. Um, so I wrote a post on my blog, I think it was like two months ago, where, where I said, you know what, I'm going to see what it takes to build an iPhone app, right? So I, I went to my local library. Um, I was able to grab a free book on iPhone app development. I went on iTunes. I was able to download the free Stanford class on iPhone development that's offered every year. And then I went to my computer and said, you know, realized that it cost $99 to, to be, get a developer license to the App Store. And if you look at that in comparison to um, opening a restaurant, you know, starting a cleaners, you know, 
you know, running a paper route. I mean, any of those things are more labor intensive than it is to get on one of the most um, emerging platforms out there. So when you look at kind of broadband access um, and, and having the ability to have access to that information, to me, it's a big enabling and empowering tool for someone to see that, A, they can create their own business, that they can learn these new things. And I think just in general, we need to educate people that this information is out there. I mean, I mean, you know, we're in an age that there's, there's nothing you cannot find on the Internet, right, whether it's a skill, whether it's a, a piece of fact of information. But, but there's a, a, a group out there that has no idea that that exists, right? That's not the first place that they turn to. You know, Google's not an instinct for them, right? And, and I think from an education standpoint, there's so many things out there that are just offered for free that you can really, you, you can really chart your own path to a certain degree without spending a dime, right? And, and I think once you do that, you start realizing that there's opportunities you can create for yourselves without leaving your home. And I think it, it kind of gets us into, you know, the, the geographic limitation. It doesn't matter where I live, I can create an opportunity for myself. And, and there's not any other medium out there that allows us to do that. Were there other audience questions? Since you've been talking about um, everything online, I was hoping you might all be able to elaborate more in offline, like the multi-tiered approach of you no know, grassroots engaging um, minorities and so forth. Don't do it. I, I mean, I think. I mean, I think you have to answer your own question. Is from you know everybody today because of whether it's the economy. Um, how fast we need to move is trying to do um, more in less time, right? So you guys have been in, in the political space, I'm sure, for some time now. You know the time and effort it takes to do an on-the-ground grassroots campaign, right? Now, in comparison, in terms of um, doing an online campaign where you can reach a larger audience with, with less resources and get feedback, right? The difference is, too, is when you're on the ground, you may reach them, but you may not necessarily get the same feedback. I mean, there, there's a, you know, what I call kind of tech confidence. People are a lot more open when they're not staring you in the face, right? When they're at their home, they, they'll tell you what they, what they want you to know because it's not like you're going to come knock at the door and have an argument about it. So you get free-flowing expression. So I really believe, you know, I, I think in some areas grassroots is important because people still want to see that you're connected to them. But really the grassroots is for the people who aren't connected, right? I mean, if you think about it and you look at any of your campaign data, I have to believe where you focus grassroots on were areas that you knew people weren't connected. Where people were connected, you, inter you interacted with them on the, the platforms and the mediums that they use, and you got feedback, and you were able to react to that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a slightly different point of view on that. I, I think that with some communities, you do absolutely need a, a multi-tier approach. And the reason is because of the trust factor. You, you need to connect with them on a personal level and then follow it up and, and augment that outreach with an online campaign. Um, but the face-to-face -face personal interaction is still quite important for many communities. And, and to do that, you have to connect with them where they are, which you know, might be central locations. Um, but can also be things like universities and, and uh, connecting with young people at university organizations. I, I think amongst young audiences, I think young audiences can smell a rat online or offline. I think, I think offline's the, the way to go, like in building trust. I, I mean, anyone can do online, and but if that name has never been brought up offline within their, their sphere of friends and, and, and at the dinner table or if they're going out to eat at a restaurant or in, in college or, or anywhere else, I think <laughs> I think offline is probably the most important thing even before they, they get onto Facebook and, and trying to get that name out there. and it, It's a trust issue um, because, I mean, on, online, when I'm online, I can, I can see anyone who's online and do I trust them or not? Had that, have I heard their name before? Uh, in my community, I think it's more a lot more important than oh, this guy has a great message on Facebook. So, off, I think offline is is definitely the way to go, even before you even get on Facebook. It, it's just uh, common sense to me, and and for young people, like it's it's so easy to see who's authentic and who isn't because of that. Bill, did you want to add Please. <clears throat> I have to agree with all of the panelists here in a in a bit of a different way with each. Uh, Edelman runs an annual uh, poll called the Trust Barometer. Uh, we're in our 10th year of that poll. And one thing that we found over time, specifically following the global economic downturn, uh, is that 
someone like myself is the most trusted person. Uh, each person has that image in their mind of who that someone like myself is. Uh, given that, I think that there is a there is a need for offline communication and engagement. Um, I can speak specifically to Latino audiences, uh, where we have many countries of origin, many, many specific nuances between country, um, between issue, etc. Uh, when we look at that someone like myself, it's developing that relationship offline and then bringing it online to augment it with more information and communication. Uh, to that end, I believe that the online experience is something that's incredibly important, specifically because of what Navarro said about uh, feedback. Uh, one thing that we experience offline with engaging Latino communities is it's very difficult, or rather can be very difficult, for different community leaders to give up their lists, to give direct access to their groups or their people. Uh, so the way to capture those individuals and work with them and engage them directly and then have them become your supporters, not your supporter once or twice removed, is to then follow up and engage them online. Great, and I would just also add, and thanks everyone, these are great answers, um, that the online tools are great for feeding into offline activities. So I know, and I, I don't know if we as moderators get penalized for mentioning the Obama campaign, but there were, you know, people were organizing phone banking parties through an iPhone app or um, organizing, um, you know, other meetups or things to do offline activities through a f Facebook or things like that. So I see a lot of ways that technology is feeding um, offline activity and then working your way up your own kind of organizational ladder of engagement that way. Um, were there any last questions? I have one more. Okay, go ahead. Hi. Uh, at least two of you have mentioned the, the need uh, to, to build trust offline in order to attract some, some particular audiences and then bring them to the online uh, activity. But I would like you to elaborate more on that, especially with the people that is not really that doesn't really use uh, internet in the same way than, than us. That they do go to the internet, I don't know, once a week to to to, to chat with their to, with their families only that live in other countries, but they don't use it in the same way. I would like some examples on how to build that online trust and, and bring them how how to bring them and then what. I, th I think the main thing is that it, it goes back to, it, it's just a medium. I think social media is just a medium. Television is just a medium. Because the, the main thing that that I think any politician or organization would be, what 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 is your purpose <laughs> in, in, or, in organizing? If the organizing, if the organizer is not well informed on his issue, his or her issue, th then the medium doesn't even matter. Um, so that that in turn, turns into offline organizing and, and building a, a, a successful online organization. I, I think that's just the main thing that, that comes across. And like I said, it, with the proliferation of just online media, I, that just brings them more into check on what they've done in their life, um, what kind of issues that, that they've championed throughout their uh, throughout the, the past few years, you can check up, check on it online, and and if there's some sort of discrepancy between a certain community, and and the person who is is running for an election, the organization that's trying to do outreach, then it's going to become very apparent, um, and, and turn into an offline disaster. <laughs> so, I I mean I would I think I would chime in the fact that regardless of the medium, you know you, you have to be authentic in your message, um, and then secondly. You know, with any medium, you have to give people a reason to want to be there, right? So even with the the internet users who are only using it to communicate with their with their friends and relatives, that's their reason to be there. So you can capitalize on that. So if the if you you know connecting to the people around them, so that they see those messages around people that they already trust and have a relationship with, it spurs a conversation while they're doing that interaction, and it leaves a thought in their mind, and that might tie into offline events, etc. Now, I don't necessarily believe that there's there's kind of a one size fits all. I think you kind of have to look at those audiences and see, you know, what are their catch points and why are they online and what's what's resonating with them and try to live there and try to drop those messages in an authentic way so that they connect to them.
I think it is important to, to start offline uh, and to be, um, to connect with people in a way that that they feel that they've they've had that personal interaction. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, I worked on a campaign last summer to mobilize Muslim Americans for community service to volunteer in their communities, and it it had a very large online component. But I don't think that would have worked had there not been a very uh, strong offline component, both with engaging community leaders personally phone calls, meetings, and then actually connecting with um, you know, large numbers of people at a, a national conference. Because there were these two components, there was a, an ability to connect with them and motivate, inspire, and then follow up with an online component. But there does have to be that marriage between the two. And then finally, just one more thing, is you have to give people something to do. If you want to keep them engaged, they have to feel a sense of ownership and involvement. Um, so once you get their attention and then have their, um, their internet space, you need, to tell, you need to give them something to do that will empower them to be a part of this larger movement. So to get to also part of that question as well, it's how do we build these communities then up the kind of ladder of technology savviness. How are we, you know, building their own digital literacy so that we can really embrace all these online tools to their full extent and still reach these communities? Um, are there campaigns, you know, are there things that we should be doing? I mean, I, th I, I think, um, you know, I think digital literacy is it can be part of a campaign. I think you can you can kind of create a duality of value. I think if you know you have to reach a certain audience and you know that they they are not literate, you can um, you can educate them and inform them of your your calls, your initiative at the exact same time. And and the reason why it serves a, a double benefit is that you know if it resonates with them, then then they share it with their friends and they share it with their friends and they'll bring other people online. But until we kind of create that value and the reason to be there in the first place, you're not going to engage them. So you're going to, you're not going to have them online. So I think it's kind of a necessity at this point to, to either, you know, come up with your own digital literacy campaigns or partner with some to make sure that that those value props are instilled so that they know what they're coming to look for. I would say compelling calls to action and time. Um, we've seen uh, adoption uh, quickly, quickly saturate the market and we have more folks involved and engaging online. Um, it's beholden upon us as communicators and on other corporate entities or political campaigns uh, to buy in while you are still ahead of the wave. Um, we're looking at incredible numbers of people online and incredible numbers of multicultural audiences becoming the majority. Um, let's look at the Southeast in general, where almost every city, primary or secondary, is majority multicultural. Um, there may not be online platforms deployed at this point uh, that would service those groups. However, uh, let's look at how quickly, just over the past year, other online platforms, social media platforms, have grown specifically within these groups. This is the turning point right now. Um, this is the tipping point where we need to get out there not only with the compelling calls to action, information, educational or otherwise, um, but also to get out there and engage. I think one of the, the, one, the most important things that, that we at Voto Latino look at is net, net neutrality. I think the, the most recent FCC and, and ruling there is, <laughs> is really important, especially from Voto Latino. We came out and, and spoke out in, in support of net neutrality, and, and it, it was very upsetting to, to see that ruling that came out a couple of weeks ago. So I think if, if, if anything with digital literacy and, and, and uh, equality, that's, that's probably our main thing is, is, is focusing on, on that issue. Um, and I'm sure everyone's in agreement on, on that here, so. Not necessarily. No. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. Yeah, actually, it's a balance kind of thing because a lot of people do say that the other side of that is what will do the best in terms of investment and broadband adoption and making that our focus. So it's, it's a little bit of both. But um, I saw one more question from the audience. Authors. The, the main one that I read um, is, is Douglas Rushkoff. He does a lot of media history. He's an excellent professor at 
the new school. I think he's going back to uh, NYU pretty soon. He's who I read uh, talks about media proliferation uh, and history amongst different communities and and how that fits into uh, economics and and history in general of how businesses and organizations. Um, proliferated and, and talks about equality and, and that sort of thing. So I think he's probably the most influence. Uh, he's had the most influence on, on what I've read and how I've formed my opinion. So Rushkoff, R-U-S-H-K-O-F-F. -F. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I was going to say the less about authors, but really be active in the blogosphere. I think, you know, you get information at a much more immediacy than any. And by the time an author writes a book and finds research, their research is, is old. Um, you know, especially in this in this uh, in this industry, but bloggers really kind of give you a real time assessment. You know, if you know, classic example on the consumer side, the day the iPad came out, you're getting real time reviews of what people thought of it, how they thought they were going to use it, how it's going to change their industries, etc. By the time someone writes the first iPad book, you know that stuff's outdated. So any issue that you're looking at, you can pretty much find someone um, who's blogging about it who can at least give you a perspective of how it impacts them and how you can react to it. Did you guys want to recommend any other blogs or things for people who are trying to get a better understanding of communicating with multicultural communities? I mean, I, I would recommend uh, looking at, at research. I mean, I'm, you know, start selfless or uh, I'm going to do shameless um, self-promotion. But at Gallup, we do have tons of research on almost every community you can think of. And I would just tap into that because it's free online, gallup.com. You can look at demographic breakdowns and all sorts of information, not just on demographics, but on attitudes. Uh, just two others to uh, piggyback on what Dahlia is saying. Um, first, I would highly recommend the Pew Hispanic Center. Um, just incredible amounts of open information. Um, and then also, it's, it's a little bit old world. It's still an email list. Um, but ACER, uh, the Hispanic American Center for Economic Research, and Enes Biglione, uh, put really great information out about engaging Latinos in the United States and about Latinos in general. Um, there's a little blog called NavarroWrite.com you can take a look at. There's some posts there every now and then that talk about this issue. Great. Well, we're out of time, but I want to really thank our panelists for such not only an interesting discussion and new information. I mean, we walked in here and the name of this panel actually had the word minorities in the title and we've really you know opened our eyes that it's not really a minority that's a misnomer and that we should be talking in terms of multiculturalism and um, i've learned a lot of new words to use in the space and um, new ideas that i plan to use in my communications going forward a um, couple things just to wrap up that it's not just about kind of the online venue but to think about the general generational differences the different tech savviness of your audience, the geography that was really interesting, and, and the message itself, of course. So uh, a round of applause for our panelists. And I think we'll be around for questions after as well. Thank you. This morning, the Assistant Attorney General for the Justice Department's Civil Rights